Welcome to episode 31 of the Serious About Security podcast for March 18th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. Uh, I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined today by Keith Watson, uh, and not Mike Hill. Uh, so uh, we're, we're short one person today, uh, but we do have two articles, and Keith has both of them. First thing that we want to talk about is if you're an Evernote user, you may have received an email from Evernote on around the March 13th indicating that they had noticed some unusual activity on some of their accounts and then they had forced everybody to change their password. And while we have constantly rem reminded everyone that changing your password is generally a good thing to do, this was kind of forced on 50 million users of Evernote. Um, now, the reasons for this are related to some information regarding uh, access to Evernote systems that uh, were, was classified as intruders gaining access to usernames and email addresses and encrypted passwords. Now, you may recall we've talked about you know, several other events from uh, several other vendors over the years that have had these issues of having uh, intruders gaining access to their password system, encrypted or otherwise, and then that service then forcing their users to change all their passwords. And this is another case of that, unfortunately. And now Evernote is a very popular service. Um, I'm actually a user of it, and I, and I love the thing. And from the information provided from Evernote, they seem to indicate that none of our information was actually accessed only that uh, usernames, pa uh, email addresses, and passwords that were encoded with a one-way encryption system uh, were accessed. So they recommend, as, a, as good practice, I guess, to and not recommend so much as force everyone to change their password. Uh, now we, we hope that everybody has done that, and uh, they have not gone and, and used a very simple password on their account, but uh, very hopefully somewhat sophisticated. Anyways, uh, we can add Evernote to uh, a growing list of the number of new services online that have been compromised in some way. And that's rather unfortunate um, from the Evernote user perspective. So I thought this was a very important uh, thing to talk about. It is kind of a kind of a repeating uh, frame that we seem to be talking about a lot over the years, but um, uh, one one interesting thing that I'll point out is when Evernote sent out uh, some email regarding this problem, they put down a few you know helpful hints, and that was very helpful. Unfortunately, some of the helpful hints they then went on to violate in a in a uh, a later email uh, basically some of their advice was you know don't click on any reset password requests and in emails instead go directly to the service and then they went and sent an email saying you know click here to reset your password and unfortunately it was through a email marketing service so all the links actually were redirected to that service so they could keep track of you know what links you clicked on in the email so that kind of violated their own little recommendations there. So that was rather funny. And they later apologized for that as well. Yes, exactly. And so sometimes they, you know, they're using these email marketing services as a way to promote their service and they want to track, you know, who's clicking on what in those emails, you know, find out what's the best way to reach customers. And unfortunately they chose to use the same service to announce this problem. And so that was really the issue there. So thankfully they did recognize that issue later <laughs> but anyways well I use Evernote I, in fact I started using it um, maybe a month ago so the timing was kind of kind of poor I guess for me from a, a first impression standpoint I think I started using it and a week later I had to reset my password well at least uh, you didn't wait too long before you did that yeah <laughs> I think I went years uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but uh, we, we have had a lot of these and a lot of passwords getting broken into and, and, and things like that. And, and this is probably a uh, maybe a 
maybe not a, a good thing, but maybe a little bit of breath of fresh air that they actually did uh, seem to have, have done all the best practices that should have been done as far as hashing passwords and salting them and, 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 and all that sort of thing. And, and the, and they sent, uh, emails to 50 million users requiring them to reset their passwords just to make sure that none of the accounts would get compromised. And I have no idea, and I'm sure we won't know if any did get compromised um, in the end, but uh, but um, it was, uh, it was uh, interesting, and, and I think uh, there's been other services that have had these, we saw some weird activities, you should reset your password, and, and, and things like that, and, and I think it's a good thing, um, and I do agree that people should be resetting their passwords, but it, you know, it's one of those things that if you have hundreds of passwords on hundreds of sites, resetting your passwords on a, on a schedule is difficult to impossible to, to do. Well, it is difficult, but we also recommend a lot of password management tools that kind of simplify some aspects of that. Um, I, my current default uh, password regime is uh, 25 character long passwords. Now, you could ask me what my Evernote password was and is currently. I have no idea. But I know where it is in the database that I use. Well, when you have a when you have a twenty five character password, I think your your requirement to change your password uh, every six months or a year or whatever is considered the best probably isn't quite as relevant as when probably. you just choose one out of your memory and remember it, which you can't you you would have a hard time remembering a 25 character password that is randomly chosen as opposed to a, say a passphrase or something like that. Well, yes, absolutely. That would that be a little true. bit a lot easier to crack if you did choose a 25 character passphrase. So, but Maybe. still. It's a number game after that, so right. <laughs> so I think we may have Josh Gillum on the line here who's joined us. Josh, are you there? Well, he may just be listening in today, and that's great. We're inviting more people to do that. So, well, he has no mic or camera. That appears to be the issue, but that's all right. Josh can still listen in. So, I don't know if there's much more to say about this with Evernote. I mean, it's unfortunately unfortunate that they uh, they got whacked a little bit. Uh, so far, as far as they can tell, and what they've been able to share, there isn't... Uh, any indication that our information was accessed. Um, personally, I don't put anything too sensitive up there. It's mostly notes for me and you know, what's in my head. Uh, so it's not anything too critical and nothing business related. So uh, I'm sure there are some people that do put more sensitive information up there and assume it's safe. And I don't know if I'd recommend doing that. Well, and, and and the other thing that I have to say about this is I not I don't know what the extent I don't know if they got access to the password hashes have they did they confirm that 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 was that was they actually got access or they just saw anomalous activity and they may have gotten access. It says that it was accessed on their blog page. Okay. Well, I I I I think that it's good that they had everybody reset their passwords. I remember LastPass I think a while back said had sent emails to people saying we saw some anomalous activity and are 99.9% .9 sure they didn't get access to anything but you should probably reset your password anyway just in case and and I find that especially from a, a company that handles uh, my passwords and security uh, as a very good uh, thing when just a little bit of anomalous activity that they find is enough to trigger them telling me about it and saying I should reset my password. So I don't think this is necessarily a, a, a strike in, in to them. I think it's a good thing that they that they took actions with this and didn't try and say, oh well, we're not sure if they can they actually did anything, so we're not gonna you know announce it to our users or we're not gonna give it we're not give it gonna give it very much importance. Right. 
Uh, and the other interesting thing was they tried to update their mobile applications so that you could reset your password through the mobile app a little easier. Unfortunately, I don't think they quite got it right the first, the second, or the third time because I got I received approximately four updates between the time the password problem was announced and uh, and and I think even last night I had another Evernote update and I think it was all related to that password reset thing. So I think they rushed something out that may not have been fully ready, at least on the Android version of Evernote. So that was kind of annoying. Well, anyways, let's turn now to our next article. And that is related to the NIST National Vulnerability Database getting hacked. And what, what irony here. This is the database that is listing um, vulnerabilities in a wide variety of services and software and it itself then becomes a victim <laughs> of, of some issues and so this is uh, kind of frustrating if you think about it. We hope that that NIST would have better protected its own database of vulnerabilities but apparently that uh, did not happen. And so that's uh, very annoying. And there was some information basically that the back on uh, March 8th that the uh, firewall that NIST used uh, detected suspicious activity and they took some steps to uh, basically uh, to block that unusual traffic. And then later on the 14th of March, it said NIST is beginning uh, began investigating the cause of the unusual activity and servers were taken offline. Malware was discovered on two NIST web servers and was then traced to a software vulnerability. Oh, the irony is thick here. So, so not only did they get whacked, they got whacked by a vulnerability in the vulnerability database. Uh, so that uh, you know what? What else can you say about that? I mean, this is a, a good sign that if if this is the database in which we keep track of these sorts of things, and it gets whacked itself by uh, a problem, it's going to have to report itself in its own database, right? <laughs> well, uh, I, I I think that yes, it, it, it is extremely ironic that they got hit by a, a, a vulnerability that they themselves posted, and there was a patch for in my from what I can tell, from Adobe, it was a no, Adobe Cold Fusion, uh, I guess, type, type or a, a, what was it, a, a, via an Adobe vulnerability in Code Fusion, which uh, Adobe issued an advisory on January 4th and delivered a patch on January 15th. So there was a patch available. This was a, a, a vulnerability they had posted on their site, and they got hit with it because they hadn't patched it. I, I, I guess is the is the I, very ironic uh, situation. They posted it, the the po they post the vulnerability, they post the patch, but they didn't apply the patch themselves, and so they got hit with uh, with this uh, delivering of malware. Yeah, and in Cold Fusion, I mean, is any I thought they had pretty much uh, canceled that product a long time ago. <laughs> I, don't, I don't recall Code, Cold Fusion being a big uh, player in the web application space lately. Um, so I guess that points to another issue of if, and I have to double check, but I'm pretty sure Cold Fusion was a uh, retired product. If Cold Fusion is, or any older web framework, let's say, is still in use in a production environment, what are the likelihood that vulnerabilities in that type of tool are going to get patched in the future? And shouldn't the organization look at, you know, retiring that system, replacing it with something else fairly quickly? Well, clearly Adobe is still patching uh, issues for it because they, they released a patch uh, two months ago for it. I don't know what the current status of it is. I have heard of a lot of people still using it, so I'm not sure uh, what the current status of Cold Fusion is. Okay, well, it's been a long, long time since I heard anything for that one, so <laughs> I was a little, a little concerned about that. Anyways, getting back to the issue, this was reported by or or noticed 
partially noticed by a gentleman in Finland, and his name was Kim Halavakoski, and I probably butchered his name, and I apologize, Kim, if I did that. I'll read the first part of your name, which is actually something I can pronounce. And basically, he found several instances of malware on the public side of this uh, vulnerability database. And so, uh, kind of sent him a note and said, hey, what's going on? And then that's when he got a uh, reply back from somebody in the NIST uh, public relations office, I guess you'd call it, and kind of reported back. And if you go to the Google Plus post by uh, Kim, he does have a list of a variety of articles and information that he received uh, related to this particular problem. And he's got a list of various articles uh, pointing to this uh, problem, which is uh, it's good that he's keeping track of that and and uh, posting those. And it also, he has posted the reply he received from NIST related to the database problem that he had reported earlier. So um, he, he's a good source of information here as well. I believe we have a link. If not, we'll have a link in our show notes for that. Well, just an update. Cold Fusion is still being, being done. Uh, they're on version 10. And uh, it's still a product. It's still you can still purchase it. It's still being regularly updated, version-wise and patched. It's a it's a app for building Java uh, app to, for for building and uh, and and running Java web applications. Okay, so I apologize for that. It's actually a legitimate project. I predicted its death a little too soon, I guess. So, <laughs> anyways, I I don't know much what else we can say about this. Yeah, you know, I'm still shocked by the irony of this problem, if you think about it. So, I guess this, you know, even proper system management and software updates are are, you know, this is a prime example of why you have to keep on top of these things. Well, um, NIST does say that um, two things. First off, that they do not believe that malware was uh, delivered to any visitors. And they also say that their, their system was compromised prior to the patch being released by the vendor. So um, that, that's, that's the two things that they say. So uh, I guess they, it happened prior to them actually posting the vulnerability, and also they say that n that no malware was actually delivered to visitors to the site. So I guess they caught it uh, quickly enough to prevent the malware from actually being delivered. Well, that's good. Hopefully, that's true as well. Well, I'm not sure what else we can say about that. I'm just, you know, shocked by the irony of it. I guess. Yeah, it, it is ironic, and I guess with that, we will wrap up the show. Um, thank you to Keith Watson. Uh, I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.